Bacteria are microscopic organisms. And you might think to yourself, they're so tiny, you need a microscope to be able to see them. So they can't really cause that much harm, surely. We are so much bigger than bacteria. But you would be wrong. There are so many bacteria out there in the world that seriously do mean you business. And some of them use us primarily as their host and their mode of transport and the thing that they like to feed off of, um, that some of them can be really quite deadly. Bacteria can live on inanimate objects, such as door handles, window sills, kitchen sides, absolutely anything. They're able to stay on there and different species of bacteria can survive for different periods of time. It all depends on the species that you have. There are other factors that affect the bacteria's ability to survive on, um, on a surface. So that includes um, exposure to UV radiation. So if it's on a windowsill that's bright in the direct sunlight, that UV radiation is going to break down some of the DNA inside of the bacteria and kill them. It includes things like the pH of the environment that they're in, um, access to water, um, if there are any chemicals on or around that surface, if you wipe it regularly. All of those types of environmental factors are going to affect how long the bacteria can survive for. But some have got some amazingly clever strategies to survive. Some create little capsules where they hunker down inside of the capsule and they stay inside there. Others will release spores that they can spread and others will produce a biofilm. Now what that means is it's, um, it's a cluster of bacteria that are all living together and those bacteria are there um, sort of gathering nutrients and, and spreading it around to sort of the colony. A little bit like if you watched uh, Star Trek, a little bit like the Borg. They kind of all live together and hunker down together and try and survive whatever environmental exposure we've put them through. One of the issues that we have now with bacteria is that we have created um, really the globe to be quite small. We can travel absolutely anywhere. We can get anywhere by train, plane or boat. So we can travel around the globe. And as we go with us, we take with us bacteria that wouldn't usually be in that environment. There are certain bacteria that survive really well in arid, dry environments. And there are others that travel and prefer moist environments. But now what we're doing is we're, tra we're making these bacteria travel around and bacteria have some really clever strategies of passing on information to other bacteria to say, hey, I've just had this experience, it almost killed me, it did not. Let me give you the information to show you how you could survive a very similar experience. And that's where the issue of bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance is coming from. We have been using the same few types of antibiotic drugs for a long time, and they've been really effective. They really have worked and done really, really, really well for us. But it's starting to not work anymore. Bacteria are not stupid. They're getting clever and they're getting wise to the ways that we are trying to kill them. And some of the bacteria, the ones that we're going to cover today, are antibiotic resistant. So what that means is that if you get one of these types of bacteria, you often need to have an extended lengthy hospital stay or even not survive the bacterial infection at all. So in today's video, we're going to cover top five deadly bacteria. Hi everybody and welcome to the channel or welcome back to the channel if you've watched any of my videos before. In today's video, we're going to look at top five deadly bacteria. We're going to look at what they are, how they spread and what they do to you if you get them. Also, where you can generally pick these things up. So let's do a bit of a deep dive on five top deadly bacteria. Deadly bacteria number one. Our first bacteria is in the Pseudomonas genus, and we're going to look at Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now the Pseudomonas genus, what that means is that there are lots of different species under that one umbrella term. And so we're going to look today at one of the deadliest. So this particular bacteria, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is a rod-shaped bacteria that is antibiotic resistant. So we can treat it with some antibiotics, but generally what you'll find is you'll need several antibiotics all sort of working together to try and kill off this particular bacteria. This particular bacteria affects immunocompetent and the immunocompromised. So what that means is immunocompetent are healthy people and immunocompromised are those people who are already ill. So this particular bacteria doesn't care if you are ill or not, it's going to get you either way. Whilst you're trying to kill off this particular bacteria with antibiotic drugs, it has a whole system to try and protect itself. It's really adapted to survive outside of a host and inside of a host. It has lots of clever strategies to keep itself alive so that you can't kill it as quickly as you might like. Where can you find Pseudomonas aeruginosa? 
This bacteria can mostly be found um, in water systems. So any waterways, ponds, pools, any reservoirs of water, anything like that, you're going to be able to find Pseudomonas aeruginosa. However, due to its um, well-adapted survival strategy and us spreading the bacteria around, it's now it's now largely connected with hospitals as well. So if you go into a hospital, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is going to be everywhere. It's going to be in the air vents, in any um, on any equipment, on any surfaces. It even lives on hand sanitizers. So. It's, it's like it's trying to take the mick out of you, you know, like, oh, you've put on some hand sanitizer to protect you from bugs. Well, I'm just, I'm going to actually live on that. It lives on soap. It lives on anything that you would think that would clean the thing away. It's, it's quite a prolific spreader and it can survive quite a lot of uh, different uh, strategies to kill it. Who is the main target for this bacteria? Anyone. Literally, these little rod-shaped blighters are out there to try and take down anybody. They really don't care if you are sick or not. They want to enter your body and they want to make you sick. They're mostly distributed through um, coughing, sneezing, um, and any sort of um, aerial projection uh, that, that you can sort of do. So uh, anytime that you are sort of coughing or sneezing or anything like that, you are uh, projecting this particular bacteria out into the environment where it can survive inside of the air, in order for someone else to breathe it in. They do form a biofilm and that biofilm um, is really difficult to detect. So sometimes the biofilm itself can actually grow on surgical equipment and doctors and things have no idea that that bacteria is actually growing on surgical equipment that might be um, inside your body. So if you have any sort of um, nasal tubes or anything like that that enters into your body, the biofilm can be growing on the tube and then go into your body that way. So they are very clever and very hard to detect. Being said that they like to attack absolutely anybody, they do have some particular favourites if you are feeling sick. So anybody with cystic fibrosis, anybody that has got bronchitis, burns, anyone that's going through organ transplantation, if you have a catheter, if you have um, an endotracheal tube, if you have cancer, anything like that, if you have any of these conditions already, this particular bacteria wants to get inside your body. You are immunocompromised generally if you have any of these conditions, especially anything connected to the lungs and airways. This bacteria absolutely loves that environment and so it is one of the things that when you go into a hospital to have any sort of hospital stay, you will receive um, antibiotic treatment it isn't for something you already have it's to try and prevent the thing getting into your body in the first place symptoms of infection all, de all depending on the way that this bacteria has got into your body will all depend on um, the symptoms that you're going to present with which can make it really difficult to be able to pinpoint exactly what is wrong with you when all depend on your symptoms will all depend on the, the method this bacteria has got in but the symptoms could largely be anything else so for example, if um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa has got in by your blood way, if you've been if you had a cut or burns or anything like that to your skin, and Pseudomonas has got in that way, you will have chills, you'll have a cough, you'll have a fever, um, you'll have you'll be really fatigued, you'll be really tired, you'll feel quite drained, um, which really could be the symptom of, of a great many different infections that you could possibly have. So it can be really hard to tell if you get it in that way. If it gets into your lungs and you're going to have coughing, wheezing, tightness of chest, you're going to have lower blood pressure, it's going to affect um, the way that you breathe, you're going to do a lot of coughing, a lot of sneezing, to try it. what it's trying to do, it's trying to project itself out. So in any way that it can sort of make you um, project out more of the bacteria to infect more people, it's going to do it. For those patients that have cystic fibrosis or any um, degenerative lung condition, getting this bacteria um, during a hospital stay or when you're out in the in the wild sort of thing and not in a hospital um, massively reduces your life expectancy so this particular bacteria is particularly harmful for anybody that has any sort of lung condition now like i mentioned earlier on one way that doctors sort of try and deal with this is anybody that has these conditions generally has a whole cocktail of different antibiotics and it's to try and prevent it from getting into your body as opposed to trying to treat it once it's in your body once it's inside your body it can be really difficult to treat and your symptoms might not be really obvious because they're going to be the symptoms that you have as part of your condition anyway so this particular bacteria is sneaky and it really does mean business it does limit life deadly bacteria number two the second bacteria that we're going to look at today is Acinetobacter bomani. Now this particular bacteria 
is is one that we didn't really think we had too much of a problem with anymore. However, it's it's developed a bit of a resurgence. So it has a connection with um, soldiers, so uh, conflict soldiers that are coming back into their home countries are bringing with them this particular bacterial infection. It prefers open wounds. So Acinobacter bomani prefers open wounds and open cuts and lacerations to the skin. Now, unfortunately, many of our conf- conflict veterans have experienced those types of situations. And so the bacteria gets into their bodies and it's now developed strong antibiotic resistance. Because people have been uh, maybe unable to get the right treatment that they needed, or they've been taking you know, some antibiotics, not completing their antibiotics because obviously they're in cl- conflict zones. You know, Our veterans aren't really looking after themselves. Um, this particular bacteria is now starting to spread and it's starting to cause a bit of an issue. This bacteria prefers uh, moist-like environments, so it can stick to uh, mucous membranes, but it does prefer an open wound. It prefers a nice, easy way into the human body. It has a squat sort of um, rod shape, although the shape of it can change, all depends on the environmental conditions that it finds itself in. So if it's a dry, arid condition, it will look one way. If it's a moist environment, it will look a different way. So um, because it dev- because it has this phenotypic plasticity, which means that the way that it looks changes, um, it can be quite difficult to identify underneath a microscope because it will change and look different. Where can you find Acinobacter bomani? These bacteria live in soils and waters, and so it's really easy to see how you would pick them up. The issue with this particular bacteria is that when we are identifying bacteria, we do something called a gram stain. So we stain bacteria, and what we're looking for is a, is a colour. So bacteria will be uh, pink or purple, or depending on the type of bacteria. It's out of the scope of this video to cover that, but I will cover about gram staining and things in another video. But just for the sake of um, benefit, if they if they are a certain colour, then we give them a certain type of classification. Now, because this particular bacteria, the dye that we use actually washes out of them, which is really unusual. It's not common at all for that to happen. It means that this bacteria is often misidentified and misclassified. So people will look at it and think, oh, that's safe. It's a, it's a normal, um, healthy bacteria that we want in us, inside our bodies. And so it will get missed entirely. And then you have a problem because this bacteria is then going to absolutely spread. So it's a very sneaky bacteria that changes the way that it looks and we misclassify it all of the time. One of the main places that we've actually got it from now, the reason that it's spreading is it came from Iraq. So a lot of our um, conflict veterans that came from Iraq brought with them uh, Acinobacter bomani. Who is the target for Acinobacter bomani? This particular bacterium is opportunistic and so it grows on surfaces and hopes to be picked up. It isn't directly sort of trying to target you, but it will get inside your body if it can. And so because of that reason, it's generally uh, associated with the with the immunocompromised. So anybody that who is already sick or anybody who is in a hospital who is sick or has any sort of cut, wound or surgery um, will generally pick this up. Because it can survive for such a long time on surfaces, it is associated with hospitals. So we do connect um, Acinobacter Bomani with uh, a hospital stay and if you have any sort of open wound burns or surgery it will generally try and target those people. When I was researching the deadly effects of this particular bacteria um, it came, we came up with a few different uh, results when I, when I was looking at the research and, and looking at the medical literature. Um, all of my references by the way are all cited in the description box below so if you want to look at any of the journals yourself they're all in there. Um, But some people said that this particular bacteria causes hepatitis and so then has a death rate of 70% and others had um, an increase in death rate uh, by 35%. So if if your likelihood of survival was say 50% previously, then you get Acinobacter bomani, um, it then goes up to like, you know, 85%. But why is it the case? Why is it that we can't exactly pinpoint um, how deadly this particular bacterium is? The issue with bacteria is because it causes other illnesses or you are ill previously and this gives you more symptoms, it can be really hard to determine if the bacteria itself has led to your death or if your death was going to happen anyway and this just gave you more illness, if that sort of makes sense. So it can be really difficult to pinpoint it on a particular bacteria because you are likely already sick in the first place. Um, Because this bacteria is sneaky, we misidentify it, it can't always be um, seen, it can be really, really difficult for those people that have um, 
maybe got an open wound that then get this particular bacterial infection that is antibiotic resistant, it can be really hard to determine if it was a bacteria that um, assisted your passing or if it was something else. Symptoms of infection. When on the skin, this particular bacteria gives the skin um, like an orange peel type look and texture. That if the bacteria sort of continues to grow on the skin, that changes to so like a rough sort of sandpaper-like texture and appearance. If the bacteria then gets into your blood, either through a cut or a wound or a burn or something like that, it can create some horrible complications. So it can give you pneumonia, it can give you hepatitis, it can give meningitis, and it can give many other blood-borne type um, infections and illnesses. So it can spread quite, quite rapidly inside the blood and it can cause some really difficult complications for you. It also makes uh, wound healing really challenging. So if this particular bacteria is inside a wound, that wound will take a, a really long time and will be really quite difficult to treat uh, because of the bacterial infection and it's spreading um, so aggressively. Deadly bacteria number three. Our third deadly bacteria is Klebsiella pneumoniae. This is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae genus. Try saying that one quickly three times. The bacteria in this genus are all very sneaky and all survive um, lots of different types of environmental damage and all of them are antibiotic resistant. As the name suggests, this bacteria is responsible for pneumonia. So it survives really well inside of airways. That, that is where it wants to get into. It wants to get into um, your lungs, into your throat, and into any of your airways. It wants to try and get in there, but it is actually a facultative aerobe. Now, what that means is that it can survive in low and high oxygen environments. Because of that reason, again, it wants to attack your airways. That's where it wants to live, but it's also found on ventilation equipment inside of hospitals. Where can you find Klebsiella pneumoniae? As mentioned, one of the places that this cheeky little bacteria lives is in hospitals um, on any sort of ventilation type equipment. So any, any ventilators, anything that's going to deliver oxygen, this bacteria is going to grow there in, in great numbers. But it's also found in soils, water and on plants. And when I was looking into this particular bacterium and doing some research, um, some scientists have looked at and done a comparison between the bacteria, the, the genetics of the bacteria found in the environment and the genetics of the bacteria found in hospitals to see if there was a difference. Is it the ones that you pick up in hospital that are going to give you pneumonia and the ones in the environment that are sort of fine for you? And actually what they found in their research was that genetically they were the same. So if you pick up um, Klebsiella pneumoniae in the environment or in a hospital, they could both still lead to a pneumonia type infection inside your body. So they, they were genetically the, the same bacteria. Another place this bacteria is found and lives perfectly happily and without causing any issue is actually inside the intestines of humans. So we have this bacteria inside our bodies doing its own little thing, quite happy, uh, doesn't cause any infection. The issue is when we pick this this little blight up and we get it inside our airways. That's when it causes us issues. Who does this bacteria target? There are certain uh, populations of people that are more likely to come down with um, a, a severe infection with this particular bacteria. And that is anybody that has diabetes, anybody that has kidney failure, anyone with liver failure, anyone suffering from alcoholism, anybody that has any sort of chronic uh, lung type condition, and anybody that is uh, receiving treatment for cancer. It's also going to highly target anybody that's using any, any sort of ventilator or ventilation equipment inside of a hospital. So anybody using any of these um, are, are under, a, under greater risk of getting infected by Klebsiella. The other group of people this particular bacterium likes to target is anybody that's been on antibiotics for a long period of time. So some people take antibiotics for an extended period of time and this particular bacteria is going to target you if you've been taking it for a long time. Pneumonia caused by this particular bacteria is more likely to happen inside of a hospital. So you're less likely to get pneumonia from the environment from this bacteria. Um, of, all of, of all cases of pneumonia, only three to 5% are caused by this bacteria where you've picked it up in the environment. But if you're in a hospital for an extended period of time or using ventilation equipment, you are much more likely to get pneumonia and it will be this particular bacteria that has delivered that to you. 
This bacteria can also cause uh, blood and skin infections as well. So it can give you uh, meningitis and it can cause uh, skin rashes, skin irritation and slow wound healing um, if you get it in your skin and it causes a skin type infection. Symptoms of Klebsiella pneumoniae infection. The usual symptoms connected with this bacterium are cold-like. So you're going to have a cough, tightness of chest, um, lethargy, difficulty breathing, you're going to be wheezing, you're going to be sneezing. All those types of things that would usually be associated with like a cold or a flu are symptoms of this particular bacteria being inside of your airways. Now it can get into your body in a few different ways. If it gets into the blood, it causes one lot of symptoms. If it gets into the airways, it causes another lot of symptoms. And again, the symptoms that it gives you can be really quite generic and really difficult to spot. So it can be causing you quite a lot of significant damage without you realizing it. One of the ways that you know that it's Klebsiella inside your lungs is that when you're coughing, you will start to produce a bit of a red type mucus. And that's the bacteria. So um, it can sort of produce this horrible sort of mucal secretion um, during the um, heightened stages of the infection. As the infection continues, it can give you things like confusion. It will stiffen your, your neck. It will give you uh, convulsions and seizures. It can cause your blood pressure to lower. It can give you low heart rate and it can ease it and it can even cause death. This is a bacteria that is really quite nasty. Uh, once it gets into your body, this is one that you absolutely don't want to be there. Deadly bacteria number four. Our fourth deadly bacteria is Staphylococcus aureus. Now this bacteria is known as MRSA, which you might have heard of as a hospital-borne superbug. So MRSA refers to uh, the bacteria and the strain of antibiotic resistance that this particular bacteria has. So it is um, a very specific um, antibiotic resistant bug and it is now known as a superbug. So it means that it is largely um, resistant to all known antibiotics. These bacteria are cocci or spherical in shape and they tend to cluster together. So when people are looking at it under a microscope, they, they tend to say it looks like grapes. It looks like a little bunch of grapes because lots of like little round things all sort of stuck together. This one is also a facultative aerobe. So again, that means that it can survive in low and high oxygen environments or no and high oxygen environments, which I think is fascinating. I think it's amazing that you can have one organism that can survive with and without oxygen if you just think about humans for a minute, if we were to put ourselves in a zero oxygen environment, we would die pretty quickly. We wouldn't be able to survive, but these particular bacteria can go from those environments and survive perfectly well. I think that's fascinating. It just gives me so many questions on how can it do that? Why did it do that? Why did it evolve to be that way? But also it just shows that they are so much more evolved than we are. We like to think of ourselves as the higher form of life, but actually bacteria started before we did. And so when you actually look into bacterial microbiology, you realize that their evolutionary pathways and the way they do things is so much more clever than us. They can evolve quickly. Humans cannot evolve or adapt very quickly at all, but bacteria can do it within just a couple of generations. They can be completely different and survive something that would have killed them literally just hours earlier. Where can you find Staphylococcus alvarus? Humans are the reservoir for this bacteria. So what that means is that we are the place this bacteria lives. They live on our skin and, and on our mucous membranes. Quite happily, they live there all of the time. We are, we are the way this bacteria lives and survives. We are its hotel and resort. 15% uh, of the human population also carries this bacteria inside their nasal cavity and it doesn't cause them any problems. Who is the target for Staphylococcus aureus? Because this bacteria lives on our skin and, and on our bodies and quite happily sort of resides there, um, getting a cut or a wound on the skin is generally its mode of transport inside your body where it will make you sick. So it's quite happy to live on, on your body, but it, as soon as it gets in there, that's when it makes you ill. Another way that this spreads around is if you are inside of a hospital, anybody that's working in the hospital largely comes into close contact with lots of different people with lots of different types of illnesses and the bacteria can travel from the people that are working at the hospital to the patients and so it can be uh, transmitted really quite easily from person to person. There are certain people that are more susceptible to um, getting infected by this particular bacterium and that includes anybody with kidney failure, anybody with uh, cancer, any sort of liver disease, 
uh, mothers who have recently just given birth and the newborn babies of the mothers. Um, all are much more susceptible to coming down with a serious infection from this particular bacteria. Symptoms of infection. This particular bacteria causes some horrible looking uh, skin uh, conditions. So it can cause abscesses and boils. It can cause um, swellings and redness and infection on top of the skin and um, on the surface of the skin. And it slowly sort of starts to bury, bur like burrow itself in. So it can cause follicular damage and loss. So you actually um, loss of um, the follicles. And it can also cause uh, necrosis um, of the skin as well if it sort of gets in there. So it's it's really quite nasty. If you get the infection inside your body, it can cause other types of illnesses. So it causes something called mastitis, which is inside the breasts, usually of uh, breastfeeding women. Pneumonia, blood infections, um, any way that it can sort of spread itself around inside your body, it sort of um, spreads around and causes just illness and, and yuck basically inside your body. Um, it causes uh, bone pain as well. So some people have sort of said, said that their bones are really hurting. It, it can be connected to this particular bacteria and it can even damage the valves of the heart to prevent the heart from working properly. So this really is quite a nasty bacteria. I think um, you, you really don't want to meet any of these bacteria, but this one can get into the skin so easily because it lives on us already. So it's one that we are just so much more susceptible to get in. Deadly bacteria number five. Our fifth bacteria is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. I have saved the worst till last, if such a thing is possible. The bacteria we've covered already are absolutely diabolical, but this particular one is still very active and is responsible for 1.7 million deaths annually due to the tuberculosis infection that it causes. It is largely antibiotic resistant and 16% of all cases are totally antibiotic resistant and 6% of all cases uh, are unresponsive to all treatment types, which means that 6% of all people that get this, uh, it will be fatal for you. This is a truly nasty, horrible bacteria and it spreads with ease. It spreads like absolute wildfire once it's inside the body and it can survive outside of the body really well. It is horrible, but it is an obligate aerobe. So, aerobe. so what that means is it has to have oxygen to be able to survive. Where can you find Mycobacter tuberculosis? This particular bacterium is usually carried by asymptomatic people. So some people can have this bacteria inside their body and it doesn't cause infection at all. We're aware now of asymptomatic people um, due to the virus that spread not that long ago. So we know what that means. So some people carry this bacteria and give it to people who are more susceptible or people that are more likely to come down with infection and then they themselves get sick. When I was trying to research sort of where it came from originally, where did it sort of start, it looks almost like this particular bacteria has co-evolved with us. So co-evolution is when two species evolve together. It usually is referring to um, a parasite and a host. So a parasite that evolves to keep up with um, the host trying to kill it off, basically. Um, I did look at the history of this particular bacterium and it appears that it has affected um, there, there are mummies uh, in Egypt that have signs of tuberculosis infection. So it, this particular bacteria has been living inside us and affected us for thousands and thousands of years. If not, it might very well have been affecting us since the absolute dawn of human time. Who is the target of Mycobacter tuberculosis? This particular bacteria doesn't care who you are, how important you are, what you do for a living or anything else. If you are a person and you are currently breathing, it wants to get you. I couldn't find any research to, to suggest certain people were more susceptible. It just, it literally wants to take out absolutely everybody. There is a tuberculosis vaccine, but this is where we have a problem with the success of vaccines. So in countries with high socioeconomic standing, we do not generally have or come down with tuberculosis. If we do, we can generally treat it and we move on with our day. If you do come down with tuberculosis, you are put into isolation because of how very infectious you are and the ability to spread the tuberculosis with ease. Because it can survive on people who are asymptomatic, they could easily pass that on to a whole load of other people inside of a hospital really quickly. So you usually be isolated. Because we do not usually associate, um, well, countries with high socioeconomic standing don't usually associate themselves with having a tuberculosis problem. It means that people are not vaccinating themselves or getting their children vaccinated against tuberculosis. 
but again because we are this because we spread around the globe because we move around everywhere what we can potentially be doing is picking up the tuberculosis from other places and then making ourselves sick or people are traveling to other countries and making people sick that have not had the vaccine one issue with vaccines is that when they become so successful people think you don't need them anymore it's because we don't see the infection that means the vaccines work in in places with low socioeconomic um, sort of standing or in, in countries that have low socioeconomic outcomes, your likelihood of getting tuberculosis is very high and your likelihood of surviving it is very low. So generally, this is referring to the fact that people do not seek or cannot afford to seek medical intervention and help. You will come down with symptoms, you'll start to get sick, but there's really nothing you can do about it. Maybe you don't have a hospital near you, you live maybe really rurally, and there's no way of you traveling to uh, to get any help or you come from an environment where you need to where everybody needs to work in order for you, your family to survive and you cannot take any time off sick so what happens is family members look after sick members with tuberculosis and tuberculosis spreads so easily and quickly that what then happens is everybody then ends up coming down with tuberculosis other people in the community will come and help you and they get tuberculosis. Some people will pick it up and not have symptoms. They carry on living their best life and they spread it to lots of other people. So this particular this particular bacteria doesn't care who you are, but all depending on where you live will depend on your chance of surviving this particular uh, bacterial infection. Symptoms of infection. The symptoms of tuberculosis infection are a prolonged cough, uh, tight chest, wheeziness, night sweats, fever, um, it's trying to get you to cough, it's trying to get you to project aerosol out which is how it spreads itself. So anything to sort of do with any respiratory sort of type symptom, um, cold like flu like symptom um, is likely connected with tuberculosis. It's such a shame because this disease is preventable and curable but as I've mentioned earlier on you need to be in the right socioeconomic country in order for that to be successful. What usually happens if somebody has tuberculosis is as I mentioned you would be isolated but then you would receive four different types of antibiotics over the space of six months. Each one of those antibiotics need to work sort of all together to be able to kill off this particular bacteria. So we can kill it, we can get rid of it so the fact that it causes 1.7 million deaths annually just feels really sad to me. It feels really sad that we have a bacteria that is so absolutely deadly and yet we could do something about it. It's just certain places can't afford it. That just feels really wrong in today's society. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as with the others in this series, I hope you found it something enjoyable. Um, well, as enjoyable as you can find anything that's sort of deadly and trying to kill you. Um, the idea behind this video was just to sort of give you an idea of these tiny little bacteria that we cannot see and just the power that they have over us as what we would consider to be a higher species. Um, let me know what you think of the video. Are there any bacteria that you would particularly like me to cover or any aspects of bacteria that, that you want me to cover? Um, as somebody who is a research scientist, I'm uh, very into microbiology. It's a big part of my research. So quite happy to delve a bit deeper into microbiology. If you wish, just let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. As I said, I really hope you found it enjoyable and I will see you in the next one. Um, please like, share and subscribe. I know I don't usually say that sort of stuff, um, but I'm really trying to grow. Um, really sort of trying to get a bit of a following now. I've graduated from university. This is what I want to do full time. So please help me get known by other people and spread some science. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye.